Good morning again, everybody. Nice to have you with us today for worship. And if you're joining us online, my name is Pastor Dan Leitinen. Today's message is from Jonah chapter 2. And I will guess that if you ask somebody off of the street what the book of Jonah is all about, they will tell you what? It's about a big whale, right? And if you push them a little farther, they'll say, and the whale's name was Monstro. And Jonah was running away from Geppetto because he wanted to become a real boy. And, and then you, they kind of, it kind of gets hazy after that. They really don't know what they're talking about or what the rest of the story is about. But that big whale, well, I have some news for you. The name whale, the word whale, never even exists in the book of Jonah. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But what is the book of Jonah all about? And why are we talking about it today? A day that in just a couple of moments we're commissioning young men and women to spread the gospel in a faraway place. The book of Jonah is much more than a book about sea creatures, although there is a sea creature in it. It's more about how God equips you and me and I want you especially, I see you sitting back there, the teens, to pay attention very carefully to the story of Jonah because the story of Jonah is our story. To share our faith doesn't come naturally. It can be scary and we can even suffer for sharing our faith as Jonah experienced, as we will experience through the story of Jonah today, that the story of Jonah is much more about you and me and how God equips us to spread the gospel to our families, to our communities, to the greater Houston area, and yes, uh, to places around the world and to cultures not our own. Jonah is the son of a man named Amittai, and we learned that from 2 Kings, and that means that uh, if, it, if he lives during the time of 2 Kings, that Jeroboam II is the king of northern Israel. By the time that Jonah is a prophet, uh, the kingdom has split in two. There's a civil war. There's a kingdom to the north called the kingdom of Israel, and there's a kingdom in the south, the kingdom of Judah. And the time is about 700 years before Jesus. Really shortly, this is the way the story starts. God calls Jonah and says to him, I want you to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire, which is the biggest, baddest empire of this time. They're the world power, and they are not believers in God. In fact, a contemporary of Jonah, a historian during his day, said that Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrians, was filled with violence, where people threw hands all the time, and that there was blood flowing down the streets, and there were corpses that were piled up. It was not a good place. They worshipped pagan gods, and they were heathen, and they had ch child sacrifice was part of their rituals. It was an ugly, ugly place. And so when Jonah, a Jew, is called to go to a Gentile faraway place and to spread the gospel to heathens, the first thing he does is what? He goes down. Not over to Nineveh, the great city. He goes down to Joppa which is around modern-day Tel Aviv in Israel, just a little bit south. And he buys a ticket for a boat, and instead of going to Nineveh, he heads 2,000 miles in the opposite direction on this boat. What's he doing? He's running away from God. He's running away from his calling. He's doing it obstinately. He's doing it in God's face, and he thinks that he's getting away with it until there's a storm that comes up, and the storm starts rocking the boat, and the sailors become afraid, and the storm gets worse and worse, and they fear for their lives. They, they look for everybody on board, and they say, everybody pray to your own God. Everybody, let's hope that this works, but they can't find Jonah, but he's on their, he's on their uh, roster as being on this ship, and so they find him, but where's Jonah? Jonah went down below deck to hide. They find him and they say, Jonah, pray to your God. We need your God's help. And Jonah says, I'll tell you the truth. My God, he's the God over the heavens and the earth. My God, he, he knows that I'm running away from the calling that he has made for me. And my God, he's the one that caused this storm. I could pray to him, but you know what you really need to do, Jonah says, is you need to throw me overboard. And then the storm will stop. 
So what did the sailors do? They yeeted Jonah overboard. <laughs> and he sank down, down, down to the bottom of the sea. And the oxygen was leaving his lungs. And there's seaweed being wrapped around his head. And then it says this in chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish, not whale, by the way, fish, to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The interesting word here is the word provided. In the Hebrew, the, the word is yaman. Yaman, a word that's used by important people, like kings and presidents and emperors and, and you teens back there, parents and uh, pastors and teachers and deans and principals. It's a word that means appointed. God literally appointed a fish. He commissioned a fish. And he said, hey, fish, come over here. I'm giving you instructions. Your job, fish, is to go to the bottom of the sea and swallow this bratty punk of a prophet who's running away from me, whom I love. So I want you to swallow him to save his life. But don't chew. I want him alive. That's pretty much what this, and it is a comedy. It's a true story, but it's also a comedy if you were reading this in the original language that he commissions a fish to rescue this punk of a prophet, and this fish does. The fish goes and he swallows Jonah just like he was yemaned to do. And Jonah was in the heart of that fish, in his guts, in the slime, in the ugliness of it, but he was saved, and it was the safest place you could be. Jonah was drowning in great mistakes, and yet God had a rescue plan for him. And here's the news for you and me. Are you drowning in great mistakes? God still has a rescue plan for you. He still has a rescue plan for me. The rescue plan is for the father, the husband, the man that has made bad mistakes, maybe messed up a family, and yet God has a rescue plan for him. The promise is for a mom, a wife, a woman who has a Pinterest perfect profile. And yet she knows deep inside that it's a big, big mess. God has a plan for her too. God has a plan for a young man or woman, a teenager. A high schooler who maybe made a bad mistake out of immaturity and it cost them. Maybe it cost them grades or maybe it cost them some kind of standing in their community or maybe it cost them friendships or that they made the mistakes and they try to make another, mis they do another mistake to try to make up for the mistake and they find themselves being choked out, drowning to the deep, deep bottoms without any air, afraid, scared, depressed. God has a rescue plan for them too for this pastor that's standing in front of you too God's plan is greater this is the turning point in the first half of the book of Jonah because I've never preached on the verses that I'm about to read but that's the setup to Jonah chapter 2 Jonah chapter 2 is a whole prayer from the belly of a fish and it's God it's helping Jonah realize that Jonah's not going to get away, but God's going to bring him back, not with guilt, but he's going to bring him back with God's greater rescue plan. This is what Jonah prays from the belly of the fish. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head, to the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. 
When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. In ancient Hebrew times, the ocean, the sea, was the thing that was the scariest. It was scary because it was far away. The technology was not very advanced for maritime. And even today, within the last year, sad to say, there have been explorations that have gone to the bottom of the sea that have ended in absolute tragedy. Even, even today, in 2024, the sea was, the, in the Hebrew mind, was, was the depths, the Sheol almost, the, the, the place that's far away from God. Not just the surface of the sea, but it, when you get down beneath the sea, there was so much that was unexplored, so much that was question marks, that it was the farthest, darkest place. And in a way, it's a true story, but in a way, he was feeling the physical effects of his sin because he was being thrown overboard. And because he was thrown overboard, he was feeling the oxygen leaving his lungs. He was feeling far away from God. If you've ever had a near-death experience, you've had the same. And he's going down, 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 deeper and deeper and deeper, farther and farther away from, in, in his mind, from the presence of God. But it's not just the physical consequences that he's suffering because of his mistakes. He realizes in the same moment that they have real spiritual consequences. That he is, his sin his ignoring God, his running away from God, has barred him from God's presence forever. That's why he says what he says in verse 2. From deep in the realms of the dead, I called for help. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers, they swept over me. And then he says, the engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. He was seeing literally the roots of some of the mountains that were coming up out of the sea. The consequence of sin is banishment from God forever. Something that's not popular to talk about in the world, but it's true. Hell is real. It's a real place. And it, it goes on forever. And the consequence of sin is barring yourself from God. God is love. God is just. God created us for community with him. But when we run away from him, we're running away from him and we're saying to him, I don't want to be in community with you. And hell is the definition of that. Jonah has realized it and it's sunk in now to his inner fiber into his heart that his sins have consequences. My sins have consequences and yours do too. We should be barred from God forever. That's why he says in verse 4, I said, I have been banished from your sight. Jonah's problem is my problem. I have made the mistakes. I'm the one that's run far away from God. And, and especially to, to all of us here that are sharing Jesus with other people, we're afraid and we don't have the courage to go to Nineveh. Why? One of two reasons. Number one, we're too scared. Too scared of what they're going to say back to us or how they're going to respond to us. Teens, when you go on a mission trip, you might be frightened or you might be scared because you might say something from the Bible, which is true, that might get a reaction that maybe is not a good reaction, but it's true. You know it, and we've studied it at teen group. Number one, we're afraid of the reaction. Number two, we're afraid God's grace might actually work. But we might have a prejudice in our heart that I deserve God's grace more than the Ninevites. And that maybe the people that I'm reaching out to, they need to change first before they get Jesus. That they, I need to change their behavior. I need to change their, uh, I don't know, change how they act or behave before. They need to act more Christian before I'll reach out to them. And that's what the heart of the story of Jonah is all about. But God's grace throws Jonah overboard. You see that? His grace throws him overboard in order to bring him to a place of desperation where seaweed's around his head and the oxygen is coming out of his lungs so that he can realize it's all about grace. Not reformed behavior first. That comes after grace. 
But as we spread the gospel, we need God to change us first so that we can share the gospel and change lives with Jesus. And we can't get away from God. 1 John 3.20 says, If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Jonah was aware of God's great love, and he was delivered by a great big fish. He says, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depth of the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, now say this with me, ready? Salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation comes from the Lord. Are you aware that God sent a great big rescuer to Jonah? Ah, are you aware that God sent the great big rescuer for you? 700 years after the prophet Jonah, God, Yemand, commissioned another rescuer. But that rescuer didn't come from the bottom of the sea. That rescuer came from the highest heaven. He commissioned the rescuer to go down, 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 not to Joppa, not to the bottom of a boat, not to the bottom of the sea. He commissioned this rescuer to go down to this great mess of a bloody city called humankind, where we mess up again and again. And this rescuer, when he arrived, he was unlike Jonah. But he was like Jonah. He was a prophet. But he was unlike Jonah because he did everything that God commanded him to do. He did his father's will perfectly. When God said, go west, he went west. He didn't run away the opposite side. He did everything perfectly, unlike Jonah, unlike you and me. Like Jonah, this rescuer, he once got on a boat. And he got pushed out to sea. And like Jonah, he might have looked like he was asleep when the storm came up. And, but when he was on this boat, the sailors woke him up. And what did they say? What are you doing sleeping? Help us, they cried out. And this greater Jonah rescuer stood up and spoke. And the winds and the waves, they all stopped just like that. And then it began to click in people's minds. This is not just like any other Jonah. This is God himself who by his very love went into a great city where people threw hands on him, went into a place where his blood was spilt all over the streets because of his great love for you. Because we need rescue from hell. Because the people, teens, that we're meeting, they don't know the full grace of Jesus and they need that good news that you have and that we've been talking about here at Divine Savior. That you, members and attenders at Divine Savior Church, that you know that your neighbor needs as well. That great rescuer came for you. Jesus sank deeper than Jonah in order to bring us up to God. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. You know, before they put him to death, there were some haters that came up to Jesus and they wanted to trap him. And so they said this, hey, if you really are who you say that you are, Jesus, I want you to do a magic trick. Do something really cool. Uh, make, a fly, make a pot fly in the air or something crazy like that. And then we'll put our faith in you and then we'll really do that. And do you know what Jesus said back to them? He went back to the book of Jonah and he said this, Jesus answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. His point was this, 
God's rescue plan was, was to deliver Jonah from the heart, uh, that, that, that stomach of that great big fish, and God would stop at nothing to rescue Jonah because there was a greater mission that he was sending him on. God would stop at nothing to rescue you and me, not to just see Jesus die, but after three days to rise again so that you and I know that his promises are true, that we can go into the world, that we can live in the, the shadow of the tomb of Jesus, the empty tomb, and we can go into the world and say with confidence, he's risen. He's alive. So heaven is yours. And heaven is, the, is, is there for all those that put their faith in Jesus himself. The end of the first half of the story of Jonah, right before the end of chapter 2, it says this. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry ground. So now the fish yeets Jonah onto dry ground, and the word is vomit in the Hebrew. But it's actually grosser than that. It's a, it's a term that is, is wrapped up in even more vivid imagery than vomit but the point is this jesus is risen today jonah was sent out of that fish jesus was risen risen from the dead and next week for those of us going on mission trip we're going to continue with the second half of the book of jonah about how he goes to nineveh and he spreads the gospel and people come to faith God rescues us from ourselves to prepare us to rescue others. If you haven't been changed by the gospel, you can't go out into the world and spread the good news. God didn't send angels to go and spread the good news of Jesus. He sends sinners, you and me, who have been changed by the gospel so that we can go and we can meet others who are lost, who are wondering, who don't know about the full and free forgiveness of Jesus. That's your job. That's my job. That's our job here at Divine Savior Church, Divine Savior Academy, in every classroom, in every corner of the community that we go to live and to breathe and to share that message with others. And that's our mission, especially for our teens this week as we go to assist the Apaches in their outreach. Jesus said before he, uh, before he ascended into heaven, he gives this command, and he gives this command to me and you too. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Jesus is with you, my friends. Jonah was the one who didn't get away, called back by Jesus' grace. You and I are the ones that have not gotten away. He loves us, forgives us, and he calls us to go and to share the message of the gospel to every corner of the earth. Amen?